Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. This is our weekly two cents segment with me, Pete Wargent from Alan Wargent Property Buyers and I'm here with Chris Bates from the Flint Group. How's things, Chris? Doing all right, Pete. I've just realised as you did your intro there that we're actually wearing both brown shirts, so it's um, they look quite good next to each other. Exactly, but um, now things are doing well here. It's um, obviously getting to late October. I probably should be doing a few more plans for my wife's birthday next week, and um, yeah, looking forward to sort of a Christmas break. We're um, just putting some uh, plans together for that. We're going to do a trip down to down the coast to Melbourne, driving, going to camp down on the Great Ocean Road for a week. Um, and then drive back and spend a bit of, um, see a lot of family and friends down in Melbourne. So, um, I don't know, Pete, have you started thinking about Christmas as well yet and what's been happening? Uh, I have, yeah. We did our honeymoon down the uh, Great Ocean Road. Very windy, as I recall, but it's an awesome bit of the country. Uh, yeah, the brown shirt, I, uh, you can't see, but I've got my golf shoes on here. The kids have got a golf lesson this morning, so I'll be ducking out after we finish recording. Uh, yeah, we're actually going to Malaysia, so uh, went to Kuala Lumpur and uh, Penang for that time of year so um, yeah it's a bit of a way off yet though it's a couple of months but really excited to uh, get over there and do some of the big train journeys and all of that stuff and see Georgetown again so yeah what else is happening I'm, I'm actually I'm on a juice diet my wife's doing a juice diet this week I've literally got no idea if you can see that on the video what is in there it looks like lemon or pineapple so yeah I'm absolutely starving so I sound a bit grouchy today uh, that's why. And um, yeah, what else is news? I've, I'll tell you what's been weird. We keep uh, getting recognised. We keep going out to take the kids to the shopping centre at Noosa Civic and people are saying, you know, <laughs> it's like, that's really unusual for me. So yeah, property, the property podcast, it's a bit of a niche uh, sort of area, but obviously it's cutting through because uh, people keep saying hello. So uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, Brisbane market still ticking along, but um, maybe just a little bit quieter at the moment, a few more listings around and uh, investors a little bit more circumspect and maybe just a few more people looking up the coast a bit. Oh, it's funny you say that. I was actually away uh, a couple of weeks ago and someone came up to us, which was um, hasn't happened many times before. And so, yeah, but do you see us around the trap, particularly Peach wearing his golf shoes, um, come and say good day. Right, let's crack into this, Pete. I mean, a lot's going on, on for us as well. Um, I would say the buyers have gone a little bit more patient rather than, um, you know, proactive. You know, I think that they're definitely trying to get ready, but they're also admitting that, um, yeah, it's late October now. And, you know, I've spoken to, you know, one of the top agents in Sydney. Yesterday runs the biggest, uh, one of the biggest agencies in Sydney, and they're absolutely saying that supply is going to dry up now. And um, But, you know, the, uh, a lot of confidence is in the market. Once the buyers are there, they're just not, uh, they're quite picky. Um, and chatting to another agent last week is that, you know, absolutely, they're going to drive listings now till Christmas. And, um, but, you know, not be surprised if a lot of people start listing in early January. Um, so they, they have a break earlier in the year, but they try to come back when everyone else isn't in the market. And so, um, yeah, I would say the next six or eight weeks is usually kind of time where brokers are reasonably busy. It's, it, and then January as well, because buyers are just readjusting budgets, they're readjusting their pre approvals, they're, you know, new buyers are coming back, getting ready for the next year. And, um, but I would say new inquiry has probably just dried up a bit. It always does at this time of year as people go, hang on a sec, I've left it a bit too late. What about you, Pete? It, it definitely is that. I think, uh, I mean, there's a short and a medium term impact here, isn't there? There's the spring selling season, which is the kind of short term trends where people are listing ahead of Christmas. But then if you look at um, the sort of medium term outlook, almost every news article seem to read at the moment on housing or even every ASX release it's all about the lack of supply I think Stockland had their results out this week net sales in New South Wales were down 50 percent Victoria Western Australia down 30 percent things are not going in the right direction there was also a piece in Urban Developer uh, where the uh, Jones Lang LaSalle head of residential developments was saying basically to deliver products now is about fifteen thousand dollars a square meter in Sydney, and it's costing five hundred grand just to build a box. So, I think uh, something we've talked about on the podcast quite a lot over the last year is 
Yeah, for sure. If you're selling a unit in one circular key and you can drop a 20 or 30 million price bracket, well, that's one thing. But to deliver suburban units, it's very, very expensive. Same problem in Melbourne. So therefore, for the next 18 months, really nothing's getting built or nothing's getting through and approved and commenced. And um, until prices go up and interest rates come down, we're just stuck in this doom loop of a lack of supply. It's funny. I chatted to um, all my clients are my favorite clients, but um, one of my extra favorite long-term clients, um, you know, I was catching up with him yesterday and, um, you know, he's been a client for almost a decade now. And uh, yeah, he runs a architect firm. I won't give you any more information around the client, but um, yeah, we'll have a good discussion. He was basically saying he has a lot of, uh, you know, bigger resi projects. Um, and uh, he was basically just commenting that the, the builder is really struggling right now and the developer is struggling right now unless they're the builder. So you have to have that, that, you know, the ability not only to buy land, get DAs, get approvals, um, do that efficiently uh, and have the capital to do that, but you also have to be the builder. Um, because then you could potentially pay a little bit more for the land and potentially do the build a little bit cheaper um, and actually get projects off the ground. He said that, that it's really hard for developers to do it unless they've got a building arm and the builders to do it unless they've got the development land to buy the, to buy the land. And um, but that's really changing the industry, he said. You know, you're going to see really hard for them to survive over the next few years. And the ones that do have that sort of, you know, that full all the way through the process can can go everything from finding sites to delivering like a Stockland, I guess. Um, uh, they're the ones who are going to be able to build. And so that's really constraining supply going forward as well. And the more people that end up not surviving, you know, like over the last couple of years, a lot of insolvencies and builders, builders going out of business, um, it's really our capacity to, to respond when the market dynamics really come back better in builders' favor. Um, that's okay if they're around and they're ready to go and they're cashed up and they can do it. But if they're not, then we're really hitting our supply um, capacity. Well, yes, and I, I think I saw um, uh, over the past week, if you look at uh, Cordell's construction price index, uh, resi construction costs have, I wouldn't say they're taken off again, but they, they've they certainly on the way back up. Um, I saw a news piece with um, this $3 a brick to get stuff built in Western Australia at the moment and um, yeah, those construction costs, they might not be rampaging along like they were, but it's still very, very difficult and probably best part of 50% more expensive than it would have been pre-pandemic. So, yeah, I mean, this um, this stuff takes a long time to roll through um, and it does look as though, um, and this is not just a problem for Australia, we're seeing the same thing in the UK. I think they built 20,000 houses last year in the UK, population wow. growth was you know, what, 700,000, you know, so um, there's there's a lot of sort of big structural issues that are coming out of the back end of the COVID lockdowns and all of those stimulus measures, uh, the snapback in population growth, and Australia's kind of been caught up in all of that. Yeah, I think the big Stocklands of the world, I mean, um, we'll just talk to you very quickly about their results. You set them through and, you know, New South Wales de- sales down 50%, Victoria 30 um, Queensland looks like it's up. Um, yeah, a lot of lot sales in Queensland. Yeah, I think that's one thing. It's quite, it's actually quite wild in this part of the country. If, you, if somebody subdivides a block into four, they're gone. They, they're sold in no time. The demand for new housing is just enormous in this part of the country. So, yeah, and actually, yeah, we're seeing that with some of the other developers like Murbach as well. So, yeah, there's um, there's parts of the market like in Perth, for example, and even to some degree, Melbourne is getting. Uh, new detached housing out of the ground but uh, yeah I think the the big challenge is that missing middle um, townhouses boutique apartment blocks um, little blocks of six and twelve they're just not getting built and yeah when you're trying to tackle a housing affordability challenge that that's really where the problems are coming in yeah I mean that kind of was again I'm the architect yeah I was just thinking about that conversation and uh, you know, one of the things he said I said well why have you been successful versus your competitors and uh, he said it, it's it's because they're they're you know a national approach you know they've got um you know number of you know when when say Sydney and Melbourne aren't doing as well then um you know Brisbane and Perth are doing much better and um I think you know the Stocklands of the world are going to be all right they're just going to land back yeah so, well all right we're not selling but we've still got these we're getting um the, the land ready to go to do sales um and we're just going to sell when the time's right and you know, it's all about the long game, but a lot of people haven't got that that luxury. So what three, week, three stories are we going to do this week, Pete? Well, let's kick off with the jobs figures because this was a, 
a bit of a uh, was it a surprise not really i suppose um the jobs numbers were stronger than expected i think um the big sort of uh, trend over the past uh, year or 18 months has been job vacancies are coming back down but they're still pretty high overall so abs released the latest um jobs figures um 64,100 increase in employment in september seasonally adjusted so that's a huge number, mostly full-time as well. Um, so now we've got 14.5 million Aussies employed for the first time ever. Uh, the unemployment rate on a trend basis actually hasn't budged now for four months at 4.1%. So look, there's some parts of the country like Victoria where the unemployment rate's a bit higher, the economy's a bit weaker. And uh, you can always find with these figures, there's always a there's always a softer component. And yeah, for sure, uh, hours worked probably haven't kept pace with the massive jobs growth i think we've added 435,000 jobs or 3.1% just from a year ago and yeah there's lots of government jobs and healthcare and some of the lower productivity roles but if you compare how australia has been faring to say new zealand or particularly canada where the unemployment rate is really spiked higher to right. sectors yeah australia is feeling way better and i guess you would say that's partly due to government spending uh, but the, the corollary of that or the outcome of that is that monetary policy in Australia probably uh, stays tighter for longer. Yeah, I mean, when you say 14.5 million people, it feels like a big number. I remember it was, you know, when you go, you feel like getting old when you remember back in a time when it was 10 million um, and you think, God, uh, you know, time is ticking by. Um, it's interesting that when you show the, the unemployment's really tight and um, our underemployment um, is really tight as well, right? Everyone is picking up the hours that they want. It's not like we've got a job and we're just hanging on and people are cutting their hours. It seems like that's staying really tight. I do think that big wages and the bonus and, um, you know, the, the money that was flowing around easily a couple of years ago probably isn't there. You know, I can see in terms of our clients. Um, but, I mean, this, Pete's probably one of the major issues why Australia hasn't got maybe on the rate trajectory of other countries around the world, right? Our, the, the yo-yo of where rates are going to be in, say, end of 2025 um, keeps flipping. I mean, I had a, just a quick squeeze at it there, which I'll just bring up again. But um, obviously, rate cut before Christmas, I'd say that's pretty unlikely. But, you know, it wasn't long ago when we thought maybe there was five or six rate cuts next year. Now we're saying maybe only three at best. Um is this, is this the issue, Pete, that, yeah, maybe the number's coming down, but we've still got a very tight job market that um, and housing prices and rents um, causing problems? Yeah, it does bounce around quite a lot. <clears throat> I was just um, discussing this with uh, Scotty Phillips from the Motley Fool oh, yeah. uh, just earlier today because if you think about, um, for example, in the USA, the, the inflation rate peaked in June 2022. Same was true in Canada and some other parts of the, the world. But don't forget, um, Australia, we had the lockdowns that went on for months and months. And we didn't actually see, at least on the monthly inflation figures, they didn't peak till February 2023. So what's that, eight months later? So I guess it would make sense that um, we're not going to see the inflation rate get down to the same kind of levels. Maybe we're six, uh, six to eight months behind some of those other countries. Um I think on your point about the number of people employed, it's pretty interesting that just before the lockdowns, there were 13 million Aussies employed. Uh, then we saw sort of a big drop towards 12 million when who the hell knew what was going to happen during the lockdowns. And we, we actually had a second drop in 2021. But actually, we've now got 14 and a half million. So compared to pre-pandemic in the space of uh, just over, what, four years or thereabouts, we've got an extra 1.5 million people employed. The participation rate, 67.2%, is the highest on record. So it's pretty interesting. Like, you know, who would have thought when we went into those lockdowns that the outcome would be lower unemployment, more people employed, uh, yes, higher wages, at least in nominal terms. But the cost, of course, has been in the cost of living. It's come back to bite in a a lot of other ways. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, there's a few different factors. It's hard to pin them down, but uh, high population growth, um, I suppose the lockdowns impact, uh, disruption to supply chains, all of those things have just kept the inflation rate higher. The next inflation figures for Australia are only due at uh, the day of recording. It's just a week from today. So we'll get a lot more information uh, next week. And hopefully we're making good progress now. 
Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. This next story, Pete, um, around Victoria. Let's let's crack into that because my initial reaction wasn't great, but the more that I thought about it, is I think it's not a bad move. Well, yeah. So Victoria has announced um, slashing stamp duty for new build. So uh, look, you don't need to look too far in the media uh, for a news story about Victoria's economy struggling. Um, <clears throat> it seems to be a bit of a uh, a favourite article, particularly for the business media. Uh, sort of uh, the, the the knock-on impacts from the lockdown, state debt and all that kind of stuff. The state government has announced a range of effectively demand-side measures to stimulate new housing supply. So uh, we always um, caution people about buying off the plan. But anyway, Jacinta Allen announced on uh, social media, we're slashing stamp duty and off-the-plan apartments for every buyer with no caps. That includes off-the-plan townhouses and units as well. Um, so... That's going to apply for first-time buyers, for owner-occupiers, for investors. And there's no value cap, so the concession will apply on units, apartments, townhouses, any value, no limit on price, 100% uh, deduction of outstanding construction and refurbishment costs for calculating stamp duty. And that is a 12-month stimulus. So that's pretty interesting because I think we were chatting before we started recording. And yes, a lot of first-time buyers get discounts anyway. I think up to 650k in Victoria. But now it's like, well, if you're buying a sort of a an off the plan, who knows, a penthouse or something in Turak or Brighton, you're still qualifying. So I, I assume uh, with all of the usual sort of caveat emptor and the risks around new builds and builder insolvencies, I assume this is going to be in the medium term a big sort of boost for the Victorian economy. Yeah, I think. Um... You know, naturally, in the past, they've done these uh, stamp duty concessions to drive off the plan sector, which has been a lot of investor, high-density apartments, and uh, they're not getting off the ground right now. So, you know, if the, I do think a lot of the stuff that is selling, um, not just uh, is a lot of owner-occupier demand stuff. So whether it's um, not just apartments, but townhouses, et cetera. And so particularly if you think you're in a uh, house, um, and you're not wanting to leave that house because you want to buy a really nice townhouse slash apartment. And we're talking something multiple millions here. I haven't seen the legislation. I think we've only had a couple of news articles about it. But assuming there's no cap, it means you could buy a two, three, four, five million dollar off the plan without any stamp duty. Well, your desire to downsize um, was probably already there. And this could be a really big win, um, a really big uh say in it particularly if it's just for 12 months and i'm not sure if it's whether it's settled or whether it means you've got to sign the contract and so um hopefully this is enough to to get more builds off the ground i mean that's great for the construction industry it's good to getting people particularly the downsizers out of homes which allowed other families to upsize into those homes that may better utilize those properties you know the couple with five bedrooms and you know, uh, a sewing room and uh, a room for them to read the paper in and a room to, to play with the dog uh, and the grandkids visit, you know, once or twice a year. Like that isn't utilizing the property correctly in my view. And um, uh, if they can potentially downsize to a lock up and leave, and maybe it's a three bed apartment in a, in a premium location, um, it's hopefully going to create some more listings. And so that would be my, um, obviously be very careful around anything a government offers you towards property. I think also whenever they offer stamp duty on new builds, they still make a lot of money um, through the transaction in many other taxes. And so don't think that the government's given this uh, a free win here. They're still net positive um, on this situation, even if they give back, you know, all the stamp duty. Um, is that your take too, Pete? It is actually, funnily enough, I've got my first land tax bill from the Victorian government just landed this week. Uh, so yeah, it does... Uh, they're talking yeah. back in other ways. Uh, I think in, in conjunction with this, um, Victorian uh, government is also proposing to rezone some of the more affluent a areas in a bid to attract um, some of the sort of locked out younger people. There's 50 suburbs uh, mentioned. And the general idea is to be able to uh, build up to 20 stories around uh, train stations. And that includes places like Brighton and Turok. So that's a pretty, pretty punchy proposal as well. I think if you went back over 40 years, um, New South Wales has approved more dwellings than Victoria. But in, in the past decade, Victoria is getting a lot more built. Um, I think there was the big surge um, seven or eight years ago in high-rise buildings and taller buildings. Uh, I think if you look at the current trends, Victoria is actually not doing too badly on uh, new detached housing. I think that a lot of it's out on the city fringe and uh, Melbourne is spreading. 
but it seems that Sydney is really, by comparison, struggling to get stuff out of the ground. So, yeah, some, some pretty uh, sort of bold moves here from Victoria. And, uh, yeah, I, can't, I don't know when the next election is, actually, in Victoria. We've already been voting here in Queensland, and the early polling looks as though we may well get a change of government here. But, uh, yeah, some, some bold moves. I think um, history shows if you give stuff to people, give them the opportunity to get something for nothing, they'll definitely take it. So I'm sure this will uh, stimulate a lot of off-the-plan sales for Melbourne and Victoria. Uh, all those challenges, I guess, around who's going to build and at what price, uh, they still exist. But, um, yeah, I think it could be quite interesting to see how this one plays out. It looks like we're going to be talking about some election next week as well. Um, well let's go to story number three, Pete, population growth and rent. Um, yeah, and the interlinked. Yeah, so the Reserve Bank of Australia actually put out a research paper. Um, I, I suppose there's, there's a general sort of um, view that in, because interest rates and rents are typically moved in lockstep, um, that uh, the, the sort of the, so the high level claim has been that, well, um, if interest rates go up, then investors just pass on that to their tenants. And um, I think, like a lot of these things, that's sort of partly true, but you've got to also um, sort of sort of stress test of whether the correlation doesn't equal causation. And I think sometimes the pass-through is not that big. I think that's what history shows. But also, I think it, it can be the case when vacancy rates are tight and when population growth is high, yeah, for sure, then an investor is going to look to pass on the rent. Uh, but if, if if housing supply is keeping pace, then actually the, the opportunity isn't there. So I think often investors can only really pass on what the market will bear. Uh, some interesting recent trends the Reserve Bank uh, highlighted. The, uh, the number of people living in share houses, uh, the percentage of the population, has really picked back up. It dropped dropped quite sharply through the pandemic, as you'd expect, because uh, I suppose with all, all of those rules, restrictions, uh, loads of working holiday makers and visitors just weren't in the country. Uh, but that's kind of gone back now to the pre-pandemic level and possibly seems to be even heading above. So um, there's definitely some evidence that uh, net overseas migration is probably now peaked. People are bunching up again. Household sizes are increasing. So there is a bit of a an easing of demand, even though the rental market overall is quite sort of quite tightly packed and pretty um, yeah pretty tight really. But um, I think you probably find that we've sort of gone past the peak of the uh, the frenzy and in increasing rents. And uh, yeah, the um, I suppose the research paper, as you might expect, show that. Yes, yeah, so low interest rates and rents often move together. It's not quite as straightforward as interest rates go up and investors pass on rents. A lot depends on market dynamics. Oh, I think that's exactly right, Pete. The, the market dynamics drives prices, not what happens to interest rates. So what does the change in higher interest rates do? Potentially, it means less investors. But what we've seen in the last little bit has been you know, a pretty healthy um, stream of investors in the market um, for many different reasons, but not in the same locations of past investors that's the the structural shift you know they've gone to the adelaides and perth and um you know brisbane to a lesser extent versus um in the past and so the restructuring of our rental market will lead to um changes in the investor supply which is our rental supply right in, in what in terms of investors buy so higher interest rate change market dynamics um it forces people to go looking for different properties it changes what people upgrade to and what their ability to do changes borrowing capacities etc that then in turn um, changes the market. And I think um, you know, changing your rent over short term is really hard, but it's what happens to vacancy rates, what happens to um, you know incomes and economy and all of these sort of things. Um, investors can't just say, oh, my costs went up 15%. I'm going to increase my rent 15%. Well, if the neighbor, which is also an investment property, doesn't increase the rent, well, hang on a sec. Why don't we just move into the neighbor's property that's you know 10% cheaper? Um, and so, um, yeah, I think what we're seeing at the moment is that a lot of investors absolutely have bailed in the last two years. And, you know, even if rates stay, you know, reasonably high for the next three or four years, you're going to still see a lot of people in a lot of pain if their mortgages stay, you know, four plus, um, particularly people who have leveraged up and uh, or are getting closer to retirement, just saying, hang on a sec. Uh, why don't I just put the money in the bank and sell that property and get out of the investor market and um, and pay off my home loan and, and build myself a buffer? Uh, particularly, prices run a little bit. People want to take money off the table. So, yeah, I hate that sort of. Oh, we can't put you know uh, investors you know 
uh, costs up because they'll pass it on to tenants. Well, yeah, only if they uh, have the market dynamics supporting them. Yes, I think, um, you know, we're generally finding that the market is a bit more balanced at the moment. I think uh, investors are still in the market, but they're not piling in with abandon like they were before. A lot of first-time buyers around, but there's just a little bit more choice. Things have eased up a little bit. I think um, the outlook for the next uh, six months and probably maybe even the next nine months is going to be focused around two things. One, interest rates, and secondly, uh, federal election. There's a lot of um, jostling going on now about proposed policies. I think uh, Labour's sort of made, laid out its stall already. Coalition is trying to find a way to differentiate itself. I think they're talking about a one-quarter cut to permanent migration, which I think would take some of the pressure off uh, rents, although... I guess there's always that question about what happens with temporary visas. Um, but also, um, yeah, I mean, the, the coalition is also talking about super for housing. They want to sort of uh, ease lending regulations for first home buyers. So some of that's price inflationary as well. So, yeah, I mean, and, and of course, there's the US election and we've got state elections going on as well. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, we're getting, before we know it, we're into November and people are starting to think about winding down for Christmas but I think those will be the big things to watch over the next six to nine months is what happens to uh, policy settings particularly with the Reserve Bank of Australia and internationally and then what's going to happen with the election I think uh, if you look at what the bookies think they think Labour will probably get in but maybe with a minority government uh, which means that maybe some of the other parties get more influence Uh, but yeah the coalition's actually polled a lot better in recent weeks so who knows. What do you think about uh, Albo buying himself a new house off the coast? Um, what do you think about the tall pos- poppy syndrome and um, that in Australia? Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, uh, I don't think it's a big issue. I mean, we had this back in the United Kingdom with Tony Blair. You know, he was uh, supposedly on the progressive side of politics and he's got a uh, he's got he's got more wealth than God. So, <laughs> you know, but, you know, the, I guess the prime minister wants to buy a beach house. That's fair enough. You know, I don't think it's a big issue, but... Uh, it makes for good media copy, that's for sure. Absolutely. Uh, he's doing one of the most stressful jobs in the country, so by himself. It seems like a big extravagant purchase, but, um, you know, it's up the coast and, yeah, has a nice view, but it's also up the coast It's not in the, and it's a pretty standard house in Sydney. So, um, yeah, I think he, he, he took a bad rap from that. Is that uh, your take? Is there any other last stories that you wanted to sort of raise around the traps? Yeah, it's just it's just an optics thing, isn't it? People talk about uh, the same same problem with Labour government in the UK. Uh, everyone taking Taylor Swift tickets, and at the end of the day, you know, who really cares if a politician goes to see a concert? But the optics weren't great, the way that it wasn't properly declared and so on. But uh, no, I think all all of the media stories at the moment in Australia: uh, negative gearing reform, building cost pressures. Um, all of the stories are about how do we address the supply shortage. And I, I think that's going to be an ongoing issue for a few years, really. I think uh, still ultimately, with the, the way the jobs market is, uh, population growth is going to remain pretty high. We're actually attracting people back from New Zealand again, um, relatively stronger jobs market here. Um, so the, there's, there's almost a frantic uh, attempt to try and keep pace with the building and we're just not winning that battle at the moment. Nice one, Pete. Well, happy Sunday to all our listeners. I hope you've got a fun day ahead and um, I hope your daughter has a good... I don't know why you've got your golf shoes on to go to your daughter's golf lesson. <laughs> that is commitment. Are you going to like push the uh, coach to the side and say, that is how you do it? No, no, you just can't wear sand shoes to a golf club. That's the uh, that's the only thing. So, yeah, I'll be very much a spectator today. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, because I'm, I'm on the juices today, so I'll probably have about six coffees to compensate. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, have a great weekend, everyone. And uh, as always, if you've got any questions on uh, mortgages, uh, get in contact with Chris at the Flint Group. And yeah, so as always, um, Alan Wardgen, Property Buyers, if you've got any questions about where and what to buy, if you're looking for some strategy advice, uh, always happy to book in a 15-minute consultation call. So yeah, have a ripper weekend, everyone, and look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much, Pete. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Happy Sunday. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more.